It's the deep time is uh, that that expression refers to deep in the past, whether it's our uh, you know 14 billion year evolutionary history as science has described it, uh, or whether it is you know ancestors being aware, respectful, appreciative, uh, learning from ancestors. Uh, that's the deep past and from history, not just this country went to war over this, you know, with this country, but the, uh, how things, how history manifests as an expression of the quality of life of the people who are living through it uh, as lessons for what to do to avoid, uh, to avoid damage uh, and to enhance quality of life. History is filled with lessons of that kind. Uh, so those are all past, a little of deep time, not being, not being ahistorical, not thinking that what's, <laughs> what's going on is all, all that's going on is what's now or what was since I, the time I was born, uh, but sensing into this, not just as meaningless written history books, but as uh, a lived reality. We're in the midst of a lived reality that goes way back and that is here now and being being fully present in the now and seeing what's going now and also the the future. What are the possibilities? What are the tendencies and trends? Uh, what is it that we envision and long for? Uh, and that that goes on for, you know, many generations. That can just go on for you know, next month, or that can go on for the seventh generation, or that can go on for, you know, recognizing that our planet will one day be absorbed by the sun and turn to a crisp, <laughs> disappear, uh, you know, and sort of taking, you know, taking our place in that unfolding time, time track. Uh, and that, again, that is both a, an idea, a perspective that puts our lives in perspective. Uh, and it's also a source of tremendous meaning and learning and guidance. Uh, it's not just a mental model. Uh, and one of the things is we do not, the, today, today is an essential part of that, but it is, uh, is too narrow. It's like our self-interest is an important part of the larger needs of the world and of our community, but to narrow everything down to our self-interest is destructive, to narrow everything down to what's going on today and what I want today is basically destructive. Uh, so we need to have, we need to put it in its place. You know, our stewardship is for the whole of deep time and all of life not just for us now. If we want to be wise, uh, in, implicitly, most people understand that current impulsiveness uh, endangers one for doing things that you know, will damage yourself or others, you know, regret, whatever, uh, or that uh, uh, not, you know, not thinking of the future, uh, not thinking of the future, not grounding ourselves in you know, what we've been taught in the past that is potential guidance, you know, learning from experience is a really important part of life. Uh, so immediate gratification and impulsiveness are not characteristics of, uh, of wisdom. And so applying that to our own lives, applying that to our communal lives, to our social structures, how do we create systems uh, that are, that embody this, stewardship of life for the long term. We are afterward, after all, looking for long-term benefits as part of our definition of wisdom, our working definition in this pattern language. Uh, I find it particularly useful to hold the uh, evolution as a 14 billion year learning adventure. Uh, evolution, even before there were humans, there was learning going on by other organisms and by you know, the, uh, the, there's, there's scientists today who are talking about the, the evolution of physical laws at the beginning in the first few seconds of the Big Bang. 
there weren't anything remotely like the physical laws we have now. That a lot of our physical laws have been emerging as the structure of the universe has been shifting and things that were not possible, not likely, uh, have become more, uh, more solid, more real. There's, there's ways of interacting and being in the universe which are always coming about uh, and generating their own influence on everything else. So the sense of, uh, of learning, and it accelerates with life, it accelerates with human consciousness and culture, it accelerates with new technologies, all of it is making the learning going faster and faster. Uh, so we are part of that. And to realize that we are, we are part of that process that is coming conscious in, uh, in weird, broken up ways, you know, by a long shot, there's a, there's a lot of unconscious evolution happening in our societies and in, our, in ourselves. Uh, but conscious choice is a relatively new phenomenon, particularly informed conscious choice, uh, the kinds of information we can get by seeing beyond our immediate senses. Um, this is, you know, there are, there are shamanic practices that have developed that uh, in various ways um, that, are, uh, that are not um, physical, um, but we have developed and the Western cultures have developed uh, physical ways of seeing way beyond uh, what, what is in front of us in space and time uh, and scale. Uh, and so we are learning how to learn in new ways and we are learning how to be conscious in new ways. The uh, uh, indigenous people who, who drove the megafauna, the large animals of the North America into extinction didn't know they were driving them into extinction. They were just getting rarer and rarer and you know, finally they couldn't find any more. Uh, but they didn't know what the process was that was going on. Whereas we are, uh, we are very conscious. We are driving, uh, driving species into extinction. So we have a choice. Once we're given that consciousness, we have a choice. Do we want to change the behaviors that are driving these, uh, these species into extinction, or do we want to uh, uh, just keep on going? So the fact that choice is now a growing part of what evolution is about, uh, at least on this planet. Uh, so the, there's a decision there. There's a choice to make more conscious choices, like a meta choice. Uh, and we get to do that as individuals. We get to do that as societies, you know, as communities, as organizations, whatever. Uh, all of that is a learning adventure. And the more we bring our, uh, our choice to be aware and to, uh, and to take action based on our awareness, that is a new form of learning. Uh, and that is what is called for in a wise democracy uh, setting, both individually and culturally, institutionally. Uh, we want to set things up so we're increasingly capable of choosing uh, consciously and responsibly, of playing our evolutionary roles consciously and responsibly with an eye towards future generations and the welfare of the earth that those future generations are gonna be living in, as well as current generations. And, and with respect to previous generations, what they have to give us and how they're energies can ally with ours. There's a living in a deep time, not just in a very narrowed sense of time, and uh, stewarding what unfolds in that deep time uh, is, uh, is what this pattern is all about. And, and Joanna Macy has a number of practices. Uh, she's a a Buddhist scholar, systems thinker, uh, and has lots of practices to engage people in ways that make them aware of this, uh, both deep time, their place in a deep time um, 
lineage and uh, context, and also of becoming responsible stewards, responsible agents within that deep time. Uh, the Native American seventh generation, it's like we should always guide our decisions by what we believe will benefit the seventh generation, which is an extension of acting for our children. And it's, I've understood that the seventh generation concept actually is a deep time concept because we can, in one living individual, uh, the, the maximum one living individual can usually um, experience is their memory of their great grandparents and their uh, seeing in front of them their great grandchildren. And that is, it's like three generations before, three generations after, and them, that that living experience. Uh, can embrace seven generations. There's probably exceptions where you can generate more, but that'd be somebody who's very long lived, uh, et cetera. So usually people don't have that, but for somebody who has been around and had children and their children have had children, this seventh generation consciousness is itself a deep time, past, present, future concept. And uh, uh, Michael Dowd and Connie Barlow uh, talk about the great story, promote the great story. This is uh, what's called in more academic circles, big history, uh, the sense of the, the story of life and the meaningful story of life from the Big Bang till now and on to the, into the future. And they've, they have this symbolized in a set of beads, sort of like prayer beads or rosaries or whatever, uh, each one of which represents some major event in the history of the universe, the history of the planet, the history of humanity. Uh, and they even say, you know, you have options at the end to create beads in your own personal history, history of your family, the history of you, you as a human, as a developing human being. Uh, so you can, you can embody and carry something that represents deep time consciousness. Uh, and scenario work, of course, is exploring the future. Uh, it's covered in a different pattern. Uh, Evolutionary activism. I wrote a book on reflections on evolutionary activism, and a lot of it is what I said in the description of this uh, of this pattern uh, that we are becoming. Evolutionary activism is becoming aware of one's role in and identity as the evolutionary process, and the conscious choice and the sense that we are. Uh, we are evolving ourselves, we are evolving our cultures, we are evolving our social systems. We are agents of mutation, you know, creating new forms and selection, you know, picking and prioritizing new forms, the kind of, you know, Darwinistic stuff can be, can uh, apply here. Uh, the force of natural selection and vari variation in natural selection, that dynamic, uh, is now becoming conscious. And if we are conscious change agents, recognizing evolution as the grandmama of our activism, uh, grandmama of all change processes, uh, and learning from that and you know, occupying that, and becoming part of it in a conscious way, that's what evolutionary activism is about. And of course, sustainability and regenerative cultures, that whole movement to look at how is our current uh, behavior, our current technology, our current econ economics, et cetera, how do they play out over the future, impact the resources and beauty uh, and survivability uh, of our environment? Uh, those are all deep time consciousness. Shamanism uh, is a deep time consciousness. And history, I mean, again, there's the way most history is taught is not very useful for this purpose, learning about the mega events of the explicit uh, um, the power, the power sources, the, the, the rich people, the powerful uh, um, countries, the big wars, uh, the great inventions. This, these are all fine and good, but they're not, they're not giving us lessons for today. They're just giving us a story. Uh, and we need history that looks at dynamics, it looks about how ordinary people's lives were, that look at 
how did civilizations collapse? You know, what, what were the dynamics? How did civilizations grow and thrive? Uh, and how did civilizations meet each other and do well or worse? You know, how did the diversity play out? You know, there's um, an organization called Facing History in Ourselves, which is specifically for that, looking at uh, uh, cases of mass human destruction like the Holocaust and going, who were these people? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? How were they interacting? What generated this? And what can we learn? How are we facing similar things today? Uh, horrors that we are creating today, horrors that we are creating for our future. And we go about our daily lives just as they went about their daily lives. How can we wake up and make different choices? This is a different way of doing history. Uh, so all that kind of history teaching is, is part of what serves deep time stewardship.